So we have now the second talk by uh, Ralph Mezler from Potsdam, and he's going to talk about uh, confined anomalous transport. So Ralph, uh, we have 40 plus five, so I will give you a heads up five minutes. Okay, uh, I'll run over time as usual anyway. Um, welcome uh, to uh, this talk of mine. I wish I were sitting with you there. Here we have zero degrees outside, feels pretty chilly. At the university, we have to reduce heating because of the energy crisis. So everyone is kind of shivering also at their homes. Uh, my postdoc, uh, where he's living, they have two hours of hot water every day, but that's an extreme case. So um, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about diffusive processes and what happens when you try to confine them. And in some cases, we will see that there's uh, very odd stationary distributions, and in other cases, they might not even exist at all. Uh, so I want to take you through this, but uh, as the, the audience is quite diverse, I saw from the talks, uh, I would uh, want to go through a little bit of an introduction. So when we talk about diffusion, we all know about Brownian motion, uh, but nothing much really happened after Brown published his uh, famous paper until the theorists actually came in. And uh, of course, we know Einstein will hear more about him uh, on the next slide, but there's also Smolokowski, uh, the Austro-Polish uh, uh, scientist who also worked in uh, Lviv in, U in nowadays Ukraine for a long time. And then we have uh, William Sutherland, uh, the Australian scientist who more or less published everything Einstein published in the same year, but who got uh, completely forgotten up until recently. This guy here is a, a, a very famous guy again. This is Paul Langevin. He came up with a completely different formulation of uh, diffusion using fluctuating forces, a concept that is still very uh, important in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. By the way, do you actually uh, hear me properly? No one waving the hand, so I, I, I guess, uh, I yes. hope it's fine. Here you will. Very good, thanks. Uh, it's always a bit strange on Zoom uh, when, when no feedback comes back. So let me quickly talk about Einstein and how he uh, formulated the uh, conditions for uh, our Brownian motion. So first, I want to quote from a very nice but uh, a book by Paul Lévy. Unfortunately, it got never translated into English. Uh, so you have to uh, uh, bear with, with my bad translation. So in his book on uh, uh, Brownian motion and stochastic processes, Processus Stochastique et Mouvement Brownian, he wrote, he wrote about uh, um, the fact that what we typically describe is, of course, only uh, kind of a coarse-grained uh, picture. So he writes, the stochastic process that we will call linear Brownian motion is a schematization that well represents the properties of real Brownian motion, observable on a sufficiently small but not infinitely small scale, and which assumes that the same properties exist across the scales. So there's a lot of insight already, and actually he was teaching uh, um, his, his fellow Parisians about a lot of uh, uh, properties of, of Brownian motion, for instance, the scale-free nature uh, and the non-differentiability when you look at very small scales. Anyway, so uh, uh, Einstein, in his work, he postulated several properties, three of them, uh, that are required to get to normal diffusion of Brownian process. He assumes a finite correlation time. And beyond this correlation time, you can have, you can assume that the displacements are independent, the displacements are identically distributed, and they have a finite second moment. And of course, these are the conditions for the central limit theorem to apply. And when you uh, use this to formulate a random walk, you go to the continuum limit, you get this linear time uh, dependence of the mean square displacement, where D here is the dimensionality of the embedding space, and you get the Gaussian probability density function. And we also know that in a confining potential, and this is what we're going to talk about, we get a Boltzmannian at equilibrium, and it's given by this, where beta is the Boltzmann factor. So especially in a harmonic potential, uh, we have a Gaussian uh, PDF. And of course, if we violate one of these or more of these conditions, we get um, non-Gaussian displacements, we get 
anomalous diffusion that I want to uh, uh, look at later, anomalous diffusion I want to understand when the mean square displacement gives like a power law of time and not linear in time. Okay, so this is where I grew up. Uh, I, I grew up in this little house down here in the valley in the Black Forest. That's a picture of a hundred from a hundred years ago. And uh, so I'm, I'm very very used to being confined by some external potential. Um, and um, this is uh, 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 what, what also kept the people down here in the valley. Uh, and the other point I want to make on this uh, image is that my big hero, the local hero I'm going to introduce in two slides from now, he's actually from up here on the mountain. So remember uh, this, this little picture when, when we come uh, back to that person. Before I go there, uh, uh, confinement, as we just saw in the valley, is a very, very typical concept in physics. Of course, we use harmonic oscillators everywhere. This is our prototypical example for confinement. Uh, we can also view harmonic potentials as a lowest order approximation to any kind of symmetric confining potential. Uh, we have a Hookean force that is very, very uh, nicely produced by optical tweezers. Uh, or when we anchor uh, a test particle uh, by a flexible polymer. So this is also producing an harmonic confinement. Uh, steeper potentials, of course, they exist. And when we uh, uh, go into harder types of confinement, uh, we need to uh, consider higher orders. For instance, up here, uh, when we explore more uh, the... the, the, the um, the, non, the, the, the higher orders of the uh, confinement we get to, for instance, a quartic potential, and we'll see that again. And if we uh, increase the exponent more and more, we can use it as an approximation to a hard box potential. We can also produce shallower potentials, for instance, uh, by entropic forcing uh, in confining channels. Uh, we can have uh, symmetric linear potentials as prototypes, and they can actually all be realized, for instance, in holographic optical uh, systems. We can even have logarithmic potentials. I'll not talk about this in, in certain laser uh, setups. Uh, and we can also use them uh, confining potentials on a more general scale as different forms of modeling, for instance, home ranging of, of animals. They always have to come back uh, to their home range or we can use it to describe lockdowns in, in uh, models for disease spreading or general complex free energy landscapes. So I want to talk about confining potentials of this power law shape. I just require C is larger than zero. And the central question is what happens when we combine this with different processes for anomalous diffusion? But let me start with Brownian motion. So this is this guy, this is Eugen Kappler. He's the guy from uh, the mountain. Uh, so really his, his town is just beyond this horizon here. And uh, it took me quite some time to get his picture eventually. Uh, but um, he was working in the Gerlach lab in, at Munich University. And this is the result uh, of his uh, PhD thesis. So he was interested in finding the best value of Avogadro's number from diffusion experiments. And you remember there's the Einstein relation connecting the diffusion coefficient and thermal energy, i.e. Avogadro's number. So his setup was he used the light source, and then here he had a tiny mirror, and this mirror was suspended on a long quartz thread. So it was actually performing torsional Brownian motion. So the angle of this, this mirror would slightly deviate due to bombardment by air molecules, but of course you have a restoring force due to the thread. And the, the angles are, are, are very small, so to this lowest order we can assume that this um, uh, is like an angular Brownian motion in a harmonic potential. These are trajectories uh, recorded on a moving film, so he, he uh, used his mirror and then recorded the reflected li reflected light beam uh, uh, on a moving film plate. And this is what you see. You see this erratic motion, but it's uh, um, it's centered. This is due to the confinement. It doesn't go off into uh, one specific direction. It always has to come back to the origin. 
And uh, he also used uh, a, a, a fixed film plate, and then he could actually create shadow images of the Boltzmann distribution. And when he converted this to uh, um, a real plot where you have elongation and you have the amplitude, you see a really beautiful mapping out of a Gaussian distribution. When we go to uh, uh, molecular type systems, we have similar uh, uh, phenomena. So we have complex energy landscapes, and then we can look at how particles perform, how they move when they're thermally activated in such complex landscapes where we have shallow and less shallow uh, potential wells. Of course, they are now a finite uh, height, not like a harmonic potential that goes to infinity. And the effect you can see here, this is a simulation study with uh, uh, two Japanese colleagues, Eiji and, and Takumo, and Ashitsu was part of it as well. Uh, so we have a, a protein, and it lives on this complex energy landscape. And this one is a very small protein, and those uh, uh, wells are relatively shallow, so it, they can the protein can shuttle between those uh, energy minima and is then characterized by a whole range of different conformations. So it can have a very compact conformation, and it can also have a very extended conformation. And you can already guess that this is changing the hydrodynamic radius of the uh, protein, and we can now check what happens to its mobility in, uh, uh, in water. Essentially, it's just water, and we have the protein in there. And here you can see the size fluctuations. Look at the gray lines. Sometimes it can be very big. This would be this kind of conformation. And we measure it in terms of the gyration radius, which is kind of the mean square deviation of the size uh, with respect to the center of mass. And each time where the protein is very extended, you see that the local diffusivity, the time local, the instantaneous diffusivity, is much smaller. So this is one of the things that people start to appreciate when they use different kinds of tracer particles in, let's say, a complex environment like a biological cell. You don't only have uh, uh, size fluctuations as this. You can also have, you know, one one uh, particle that's relatively compact, but there's another one coming in. They dimerize or uh, uh, have uh, processes like this, so oligomerization, and this, of course, also changes then the local diffusivity, and you need to take it into consideration when you uh, try to get when you try to to understand what you measured. Now, when we go to much larger proteins. One example is here. This was measured many years ago in the group of Sunny Shi at Harvard. Uh, then the, the motion becomes much more complex, and they were interested in the relative diffusion of two tagged monomers in this, um, in this protein. And what they found is anomalous diffusion, and uh, they could map out more or less a harmonic potential that's confining the relative motion of these two tagged uh, monomers. And they could actually fit it to some anomalous diffusion models um, that we were actually developing a few years before. But let me be a bit more specific and show you this simulation studies by Jeremy Smith's group from a few years ago. Uh, and there they were studying the very same uh, protein uh, by high performance uh, simulations. And uh, so here I have my cartoon of the protein. So we have this relative diffusion of two monomers. And of course, this motion is being uh, uh, facilitated by many, many local conformational changes. So you get a very complex conformational landscape. And what they observe just empirically from the simulations is that there are specific conformations. They're almost locked in. I mean, it's a three-dimensional structure. There's topology. So it can kind of confine itself and it it needs a lot of shaking to to free it from these kinds of conf uh, configurations and they measure empirically a power law uh time uh, a power law distribution of the times that the protein is not moving and when alpha is smaller than one you can see that the typical time scale for such a process that we call a continuous time random walk is diverging and this was actually measured, and the phenomena uh, uh, is, is, I think, quite quite mind-boggling. So what they look at here is the displace uh, is 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 the position correlation function, and then they use different portions of the trajectory they simulate. The overall simulation time was seventeen microseconds, and 
But first, they only take the first 100 picoseconds, 10 nanoseconds, 500 nanoseconds, and for each, they calculate the correlation. And you see now that the crossover time to 1 over e is becoming a running function of the length of the time series. That's something we expect for these processes, but it's, it's a very, very interesting effect. And when they look at the function of this crossover time as a function of the length of the time series, they see the expected power law that we can calculate from continuous time random walk theory. And if they combine it with the experimental results, they actually see this non-stationary behavior over 13 decades. So a single molecule with all its complexity, you have a very highly uh, complex energy landscape, it produces non-stationary behavior over 13 orders of magnitude. I, I, I think that's, that's quite fantastic. One of the effects, and I come back to that on the next slide, is when you then look at the time averaged uh, mean square displacement, it does not converge to a plateau as you would expect from the ensemble uh, um, mean square displacement. I come to that on this slide. This is something that we calculated, uh, Stas Burov uh, uh, and, and Eli, and then later on with my uh, PhD student, uh, Johannes. Uh, so we use a model for this continuous time random walk. We can write it down in terms of these strange fractional diffusion equations. I'll not go into details, but the funny thing is while the equilibrium distribution of the position at infinite time for this kind of process is a Boltzmannian and the ensemble uh, mean square displacement converges to uh, uh, a plateau given by the Boltzmann distribution, the second moment of the Boltzmann distribution, the time average mean square displacement behaves very different. Because when you take a time average, you average over the free part of the motion when you put it at the bottom of the potential initially and the confined part. And what happens is a behavior like this. The uh, process is non ergodic so time and ensemble averages behave different. So you have a linear scaling for the time average mean square displacement, and then it crosses over to a shallower power law, which is given by one minus this power law exponent that I introduced on the slide before. So this is very counterintuitive behavior, but uh, you see it here. This is exactly explaining this behavior here, that it doesn't uh, relax to a plateau. And we also see it here for a particle moving in uh, the harmonic confinement of a harmonic tweezer. So we have these behaviors here, the linear slope and the um, second power law uh, that will not converge to a plateau value. Okay. So this is kind of one type of, of motion that I wanted to show you for subdiffusive processes uh, when we have these continuous time uh, random walk dynamics. And now I want to go to uh, two very different kind of processes. The first one uh, I'm sure you all heard about, these are levy flights. So they are, they were, uh, the name was coined by Mandelbrot, uh, whose uh, one of his mentors was Paul Levy. And to honor him, he, he, he called these, these processes levy flights. And these are processes, think of a random walk. So we make a jump at every uh, time step, but these jump lengths can be uh, distributed according to this power law here. And uh, you can see when mu now is smaller than two, the variance of this uh, um, jump length distribution is diverging. And in this case, we can again write uh, uh, a Fokker-Planck equation, now we have a fractional derivative uh, replacing the normal Laplacian, and we can do some calculations. And uh, for a harmonic potential confinement, we looked at this many years back together with Hans Vorbu and Suni Jespersen. And uh, there, the uh, stationary distribution is again a Levy-stable law. So again, it has a diverging uh, mean square, uh, a, a diverging variance. But now let's see what happens when we go to a quartic potential. This is old work. This is 20 years ago when uh, my, my good friend Alexei uh, Chechkin came up with this idea. And look at what happens. When we vary this mu, when we go from a Gaussian jump length distribution to smaller mu's to these levy flights in a quartic confinement, all of a sudden you can see that there is a stationary distribution, but it's bimodal. So it comes from this 
tendency of the levy fly to perform these occasional very long jumps, and then it runs into these relatively hard walls given by the quartic potential, and it tries to run away from the center of the uh, um, the potential, and this is what's producing these uh, multimodal, or here in this case, bimodal distributions. When mu is two, you have the, uh, the Boltzmann distribution, which looks a bit flat here in this quartic potential. And you can see that when you simulate these processes over time, there's a clear bifurcation point when you start in the center. Sorry, you start in the center, your particle is at zero, uh, most probably, and then you see these two maxima uh, uh, developing at this bifurcation point. There's also much more complicated things you can produce here, strange shapes uh, far away from Boltzmann distributions. This is what we did with uh, Carol uh, Zapawa. Uh, uh, two years ago. But the even more interesting part comes when you uh, put the Levy flight in a subharmonic potential. So now your potential has an exponent c that is smaller than 2. And uh, this was work by, by Batek Dibietz, Alexei Chechkin, and Igor Sokolov. And what they showed is here, for instance, you can see it when you look at the interquartile distances. Then there is a convergence to a stationary state only when the potential fulfills this kind of criterion. Only when the potential is sufficiently steep with respect to this difference of two minus the um, Levy index, you have co confined a stationary, uh, um, the convergence to a stationary state. Of course, when mu is equal to, you see this is zero. So any C that's larger than zero will confine the particle, will produce a Boltzmann distribution. But as soon as you have these uh, uh, possibility of these long range excursions, this is breaking down and you might have a non-stationary state. This is what uh, you have for these Levy flights. And then we have a second very important class of processes. Uh, I describe it by a Langevin equation. And on the right-hand side, an overdamped Langevin equation, I should say. On the right-hand side, I have this confinement. And I have a, a so-called fractional Gaussian noise. And this produces, in the absence of the confinement, so-called fractional Brownian motion. This was uh, defined by Mandelbrot in 1968. And it's a Gaussian process, but driven by this long range correlated noise. So the noise noise correlation has this power law dependence here, and alpha is in between zero and two. And you see that uh, the sine is also a function of alpha. So when alpha is smaller than one, when we have sub diffusion, slower than Brownian diffusion, it has a negative uh, uh, noise noise correlation, which means it's anti-correlated. It's shuttling back and forth much more rapidly than Brownian motion. You will see a, a, um, a time series on the next slide. When alpha is larger than one, when the motion is what we call persistent, the, the correlation is always positive. And as I said, it decays very slow. So in a harmonic potential, everything is fine. It stays a Gaussian at all times. Uh, this we analyzed many years ago. But let's see what happens if we go, for instance, into a quartic potential. For the subdiffusion part, it's a bit difficult to say. We start uh, before uh, the, we, we, we initiate the particle at the center of the potential. So first it moves, it develops as a, a, a Gaussian. But then eventually the particle, when it ventures out, it, it meets the confinement of the quartic potential. So here you see in the center at early times, it's a beautiful Gaussian. When you go to longer times, you see this deviation here for the yellow symbols between the predicted Gaussian and uh, uh, the real data. So you see the data they don't spread out all the way. For super diffusion, it's more obvious. You see that uh, when the particle collides with the, with the potential, when it interacts, you see that again, we get a bimodal distribution. But here, of course, the, the reason is different. I said it's a persistent motion. It tries to go in the same direction repeatedly. So it tries to move into these uh, walls while trying to get away from the center. Uh, at zero, and this is what's producing these uh, uh, strange behaviors. So we get, again, a, a clear uh, non-Gaussian distribution. 
Here I show you, here it's a bit more clear when we go to a real box potential. So here we have Brownian motion at infinite time. Of course, we get an equidistribution as it should be. That's the Boltzmann distribution. When we have subdiffusion, you see now here, we get this uh, depletion around the confinement, around the, the, the barrier. So the uh, dark line here, this is the stationary state. And this is also an indicator why it's so difficult to calculate fractional Brownian motion in the presence of a boundary condition. We don't know how to do it. There's no mathematical formalism to do it. And you can see that uh, uh, normally when we have a reflecting boundary condition, we have Brownian motion. We know it's a horizontal slope, but this is much more complicated. here. Anyway, for super diffusion, as I said, it tries to squeeze against the walls and you see the stationary distribution here show this shows this accretion. And in the time series that I promised, this is Brownian motion. You see it interacts with the wall, but it's just being reflected. So it just moves away again. For, a num for, for subdiffusion, it seems like it's avoiding the boundary. So once it moves, it, it collides with the boundary, it's reflected and the anti-persistence is taking it away from the boundary. And the opposite effect for superdiffusion, for persistent motion, it's actually squeezing against uh, the walls. Uh, and also here for this uh, uh, fractional Brownian motion, now we have this tendency to move against uh, um, the, the potential, you also have cases when you do not converge to stationarity. And uh, 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 here we can show it by the mean square displacement. So some of the mean square displacements you see, they converge to a plateau. Others, they just continue to grow uh, and are not uh, confined by the potential. Of course, the prefactor is changing uh, compared to the free motion, but it continues to grow. And we can have, uh, uh, again, this um, uh, inequality when the uh, scaling exponent of the potential is big enough, we have confinement, and we can actually uh, have the same formula for both processes, the Levy flights and the fractional Brownian motion in terms of a self-similarity index that I can motivate by the uh, mean square displacement of the free motion. So you can see when I introduce the self-similarity index and then I can uh, scale X and T uh, the same way. If I introduce this um, index, then the same behavior, the same inequality holds for Levy flights and fractional Brownian motion. That's quite counterintuitive to some extent, but uh, as, as these kinds of behaviors are very important experimentally, especially the fractional Brownian motion, is I think uh, 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 knowing about this is, is quite important. One application we have for this fractional Brownian motion is actually for growing brain fibers. This is a collaboration with Kermantus uh, Yanushonis from Santa Barbara. So they look at serotonergic brain fibers and you see experimental traces here, and we try to model them by this uh, um, random walk created by persistent fractional Brownian motion. Here you see one of our first simulations. Here you see a simulation in uh, uh, a typical brain shape. And what they observe experimentally is that the density of these brain fibers increases uh, significantly where you have hard boundaries by the skull. And uh, when we use this uh, uh, persistent fractional Brownian motion, we can actually reproduce very, very similar phenomena. Now, we have more reasons to believe why, why we can use this process, uh, but uh, I, I don't want to go into details here. But just want to show you that one can actually uh, uh, observe uh, these kinds of behaviors in experiments. Um, I will skip the levy walk behavior uh, quickly and use my last minutes uh, to uh, uh, talk a bit about uh, um, the data point of view of everything. Because typically we have data that we get from experimentalists. We don't exactly know which process is behind. Brownian motion is universal. As soon as we uh, uh, fulfill Einstein's conditions, we know everything should converge to a Gaussian. Uh, we have a linear mean square displacement. But once we violate these conditions, the process gets non-universal. We can have many different physical uh, mechanisms that give rise to the same shape of the mean square displacement. One given alpha doesn't tell me which process is giving rise to. It could be subdiffusive fractional Brownian motion. It could be a continuous time random walk. It could be something different. Now, uh, even determining the alpha is not always easy. 
And our first attempt showed us that that there is actually uh, 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 something that, that, I mean, we have to be careful. So this is a, an old study uh, together with some friends where we had a very naive question. Of course, many people did that, but this was my personal experience here. We had an experiment in a normal water solution, a tracer particle, you would expect Brownian motion, no doubt. But when you just uh, uh, put a, a power law mean square displacement and you fit it blindly, what we found in that case is that alpha actually turned out to be 0.8. Looks like subdiffusion. And actually, 0.8 is very significantly different from 1. But of course, there's measurement noise and other effects that actually uh, um, blur uh, this, this power law fit and uh, make a, uh, uh, create an apparent alpha that suggests subdiffusion. So at that point, uh, we thought if we use a different statistic to uh, uh, evaluate the whole thing, uh, this might be helpful. So we uh, looked at the mean maximal excursion. That's not the typical probability density, but it looks at the probability density that your particle has not moved further than a given distance from uh, its starting point at a given time. And that gives you a, 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 a somewhat more concentrated statistic. And by fitting the corresponding moment, we actually managed to recover uh, the, the expected exponent. So this was my, my start into data analysis. And we've worked on this quite substantially. And I just want to introduce uh, two different concepts. Uh, one is using classical observables, but many complementary uh, 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 observables. Not only mean square displacement, but you also look at correlation functions of the displacement and so on. And one of the quantities we uh, came up with a few years ago is actually the power spectral density, but that of a single trajectory. So we define this power spectrum, which is the Fourier transform of my trajectory X of T. Uh, we time average it uh, uh, over uh, an observation time capital TO, and then we take the absolute square and we divide by, by the interval length. Now, the normal power spectrum takes the ensemble average of this and takes the measurement time to infinity. But in typical single particle experiments, you don't have time to infinity and you only have a few particles. So we were interested in the statistic of this single trajectory power spectrum. And for instance, for fractional Brownian motion, we could do all the calculations. And uh, here you can see some uh, comparisons of what we predict and the uh, real experiment. So you can see that the power spectrum for subdiffusive processes and for superdiffusion has these power laws that we predict. They have different slopes depending on whether it's sub and superdiffusion. Uh, but much more importantly, uh, when you have a stochastic process and you average over a finite time, of course, it remains a random quantity. So when you measure one power spectrum to the next with a finite time, you get small deviations in the amplitude. And we can calculate this, the distribution of these amplitudes and then compare to the experiment. That's what you see here. And there's no fitting parameter involved. Here we have the two-dimensional measurement. These are the red symbols and the blue line. And then we can also project it onto a single dimension. And this is then the, the, these are the blue symbols and the corresponding black line. So for the subdiffusion, we have these. For the superdiffusion, we get these uh, uh, features. And here you can see a deviation in the red symbols. And this is actually due to the fact that when you look at the trajectory more closely, locally, it's anti-persistent. It's super diffusive. And then more globally, it, it, it's really moving and it's super diffusive. And you can even see this in this kind of observable. So. These power spectra are one of the, uh, the, the, the observables that we really like, that we promote. And we also showed that they're relatively robust against measurement noise, against positional noise, and also dynamic noise uh, that you have in all uh, real experiments. This was just uh, published end of last year. Um, so in general, what we do when we get data and we want to classify what's the process behind, we can have decision trees as suggested by, by uh, my friend Igor Sokolov. So we ask questions, is it a godic, not a godic, Gaussian, non-Gaussian, whatever. We can narrow down uh, processes manually by looking at different observables. 
Uh, these observables got uh, uh, quite stronger by uh, some work uh, that was started by uh, uh, Erez Aguillon uh, and the group of Holger Kanz in uh, Dresden. And we used it, we developed it further and also uh, um, compared to a big, big range of experiments. Uh, so it goes back to, again, work by Mandelbrot. Uh, and he defines three dynamic exponents that give you uh, information on whether uh, you have stationarity, on whether you have rare events, and whether you have correlations in your time series. And by this, we could actually manage to pin down uh, our processes uh, given specific data. The last one I want to uh, um, quickly touch on, of course, is not using classical observables, but using machine learning. This is getting more and more uh, important. Everyone is using it. And I stole this slide from Janusz Schwabinski, a colleague from uh, Rotswav, and uh, uh, he has this beautiful depiction of what machine learning does. So you have some algorithm and you train it. You have lots of input trajectories and you tell the, the algorithm what these trajectories mean. And then you have a trained model and then you feed it with new input and it gives you a predicted output. The problem with machine learning, of course, it always gives you an output, even if you haven't trained it on this specific kind of data that you feed them with. And uh, uh, so first we, we wanted to know how good is uh, this machine learning approach by now. And so in 2020, uh, together with Carlo Manso and some other colleagues from uh, Barcelona, we ran what we called the Anomalous Diffusion Challenge. So we invited people uh, uh, in the community to take part. We provided data, experimental and simulation data on the internet, and then they had to give predictions using whatever they want, what is the anomalous diffusion exponent, the diffusion coefficient, and especially what is the underlying physical model behind the data. And the results of this uh, challenge, they were published last year, uh, no, two years ago by now, uh, in this paper. And uh, just to give you some uh, ideas, so we have different uh, processes that we look at, and then people were actually predicting it's, for instance, a continuous time random walk, it's fractional Brownian motion, or some other processes. And you see that there were quite some deviations between different groups. And actually, my group, uh, we took part uh, using Bayesian analysis, and we were the worst in the whole pack. So uh, uh, all the machine learning algorithms were actually doing best. And uh, uh, we will launch a new anomalous diffusion challenge this year. So if you're interested, uh, please take part. Now, final slides. Um, I mentioned that machine learning always gives you an output. So for instance, you feed it with different kind of input data, and as an example, it would actually produce, in both cases, alpha equals one normal Brownian motion. But if you ask more precisely what's going on there, uh, and you would run the algorithm many, many times, you would actually realize that the uh, uh, real output would be uh, uh, either a very sharp alpha for real Brownian motion, or it could be a very distributed one. And you want to know, if you use this machine learning, how reliable is my output? Especially, it should give you a very bad likelihood for your output if you have never trained your system onto a given input data. And this is what, what we did in uh, uh, with my uh, PhD student, Hendrik. So we, uh, uh, of course, we continue in this, but the first kind of uh, idea we published last end of last year in this paper. So on top of the machine learning, uh, Henrik puts a Bayesian analysis. So it compares many different outputs of the machine learning and then creates reliabilities, uh, confidences uh, for uh, specific processes. And uh, uh, I will not go into details, but these are the typical output data you have. You can have cases where it's very, very clear that the confidence is very high, that it's this one specific output. But you see, you can also have other cases where uh, many different processes turn out to be equally probable. So uh, uh, one specific output of a machine learning becomes almost meaningless. And now we're, we're trying to do the same thing, for instance, if we once we combine two different stochastic processes, uh, and you can see that, uh, uh, for instance, here where we have uh, uh, 
relatively clear-cut situation, but when we mix both of them equally, you see it's less likely to tell them apart than, of course, when you have clearly one uh, dominant process and so on. So we're continuing on this, and I think this machine learning is great, but uh, you need to know a little bit more. You need to know about this black box problem. You need to know that you uh, need to question uh, uh, what you get out. You need to understand. Uh, more about anomalous diffusion you can read about in these Physics Today articles that we wrote, one with Eli and Yuval Garini uh, 10 years ago, one with Diego Krapf uh, a few years back. And uh, with that, I, I want to summarize. So I showed you that Levy flights and super diffusive fractional Brownian motion, either processes that have these long jumps that carry you far away or that are pushing away, that are persistent, they can have non-Boltzmannian shapes. They have stationary uh, uh, solutions, but they are not uh, Boltzmannian. They can be multimodal, especially I showed you these two humps in superharmonic uh, confinement. But they also have a critical scaling exponent. And if the potential is shallower than the scaling exponent, there is no stationary state at all. And that's also a quite interesting uh, property for these kinds of processes. So the intuition we have that, that eventually everything should become a Boltzmann distribution is not necessarily true. Uh, and next to hard walls are very steep potentials. I showed you this accretion and depletion uh, for the respective fractional Brownian motion dynamics. I didn't have time when you go to Levy walks, also they have multimodal shapes, and even when you reset uh, Levy walks, uh, you will still have multimodal shapes. And then I told you a little bit about um, data analysis. Uh, we have uh, classical statistical observables. We need to use many of them. They are complementary. They give uh, uh, they have different sensitivities, they uh, touch on different properties of the processes, uh, and they can help us to narrow down data uh, uh, to find out what's, what physical process is giving rise to these data. And then, of course, we have uh, objective methods like Bayesian maximal likelihood or the deep learning, and as I showed you, their combinations. Uh, we just published uh, uh, a special issue of this uh, anomalous diffusion challenge in, in challenge in Journal Physics A. So if you're interested, please uh, look it up. And uh, for those interested or for your students, uh, the anomalous diffusion challenge too is coming up. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Lars, for this uh, very insightful talk. So we have uh, time for some questions. So maybe I will ask one, uh, Ralph. You said that for reflecting uh, boundaries, the 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 boundary condition for uh, diffusion and sub sub diffusion, uh, they're different. Am I correct? This is something you. Say? It's it's not the the boundary condition. The, you just have this this hard potential, but the effect it has on on the process is different. So when you have this anti-persistent, the particle moves and hits the wall. So you reflect it and the next uh, step will take it away from the boundary. For the persistent one, it will continue pushing into the boundary. And this is why you either get a depletion, you get less probability to be close to the boundary or you increase the probability. Mm -hmm. And and. I think one, one should be able to see this in, in uh, experiments. So what we're currently doing is we're running uh, polymer simulations. So you have a long uh, Rouse chain and you know that the central monomer is within a finite time range, it experiences anti-persistent motion. Because when your central monomer, it, wants to, it, it gets a push to one side, it's being pushed back by the neighboring uh, uh, monomers. So you can create this kind of fractional Brownian motion there. And what we see is, yes, we, we have uh, uh, um, effects of the probability to be close to the boundary. It's getting depleted. Yeah, okay. So basically it will stick to the boundary until it changes the direction. Okay. Yes, either these are the persistence ones, they will stick, and the anti-persistent ones, they are repelled kind of by the boundary. Correct, okay. Questions? Someone has one question. 
so you talked about this non gaussian displacement distribution so i just wanted to check whether means is it just an issue of uh, the case that the system explores the phase space partially because a lot of systems shows this similar kind of thing and it happens at the for example in glassy systems like the time scale is yeah. the issue. and uh, maybe the other system like the confined system that you talked about there also because in some confined liquids also there there exists glass transition so is it just the time scale issue it it can be both i mean non gaussianity is is an extremely popular topic at the moment so uh, uh when you go to these continuous time random walks for instance uh, they are always non gaussian and there you have exactly what you say they don't explore our uh, phase space evenly because they they get stuck you know very long time scales they get stuck at one point and uh, um one of the effects is the non gaussianity uh for the glasses i think what might happen there of course they're very heterogeneous so in heterogeneous environments you get non gaussian uh, uh displacements at least until you get to time scales that are kind of a correlation a uh, uh, measure for for the system but many many systems have shown these these non gaussian behaviors for instance you have active particles when you measure over many cells no cell is the same uh, uh, as the other so you get distributions of spades they produce non gaussians but there's also one other uh, aspect how you get to a non gaussian and this is when you think of a random walk so typically to get the gaussian tails we use infinite an infinite number of steps but assume that you have a finite number of steps and you ask the question what are the tails then this becomes an extreme value uh, argument and then you can show that your tails for a finite number of steps will actually be exponential and not gaussian so there's there's different uh, ways to get there uh you can have non gaussians for polymerizing traces you can have heterogeneous environments or you can have this this uh um pre asymptotic tails okay thanks okay so if there are no more questions so let's thank ralph um, thanks ralph again for joining us remotely and uh, let's hope to see you sometime soon I I am really looking forward to some good indian food again okay. and uh, yes I'll be there